Hello and uh, welcome to the third realm. If you have been watching some of my previous videos, you know that I run multiple drains at once on my current layout. To do this, I have set up a Merklin block system using a combination of signals and control tracks, either in the form of contact tracks or switching tracks. This topic seems to have generated a bit of interest and also quite a few questions. I thought, therefore, this would make an ideal topic for a video. So in this episode, we will cover the basics of a block system. I approached the creation of this little helper video from the point of view of viewers who aren't necessarily familiar with the concept of blocks and wish to gain a basic understanding of them. The topic can rapidly become complex and exponentially confusing. I have therefore attempted to keep things as simple as possible. I am only covering analog operations using the Merklin 3-rail system. While the same principles apply regardless of the track system used, some track elements used in the Merklin system might not be called the same or be available in other systems. Please bear this in mind and refer to the documentation of your track system of choice for equivalences. I am sure more in-depth information is available in various places, but I hope the following will be enough to help someone to a good start. Let us begin! We'll start by looking at what a block actually is. Running several trains on a single track comes with a few challenges. Trains travel at different speeds, with different driving characteristics. For example, braking distance and pace of acceleration vary from train to train. This is where blocks come into play. At its most basic, a block is a section of track controlled by a signal. It is long enough to allow a train to brake and stop within it. A train will enter a block only if certain safety conditions are met. Block therefore help in collision avoidance and traffic management. To enable safe multi-train operation, a layout can be divided in several blocks which will interact with each other. This combination is called a block system. Within an automated block system, trains move from block to block where they stop and wait for the signal aspect to change to go or green. Trains driving over certain spots on the layout will trigger signaling changes in other blocks setting other trains in motion or stopping them in the process. This ensures enough distance is kept between trains and helps in preventing collisions. I will use red or green to describe the aspect of the signals in this video. This will keep things simple. The state of all block signals is red by default, ensuring that any trains entering the block stops there. To ensure blocks always revert to their default state, any train passing a green signal will automatically set it back to red. Usually, a signal in another block is set to green at the same time, setting another train in motion. Any following train will therefore stop and wait for the next signal change. This cycle of events is repeated over and over again. A given amount of trains require a corresponding amount of blocks. In order to determine how many blocks you will need to set up. There's a simple formula uh, for a number of train called n. You need to add 1 to your n number to determine the number of blocks. For two train, you will therefore need three blocks. For three train, four blocks. For four trains, five blocks. And for five trains, I leave you to do the maths by yourself. So what do we need to set these blocks up? Well, we'll need some tracks, of course. We'll also need some contact or switching tracks, some signals or relays for the uh, stopping sections in each block. We'll also need some insulation strips to isolate the center connector of the Merkling track segments. 
We'll also need some power tracks or feeds to provide power to all sections sandwiched between two uh, sets of stopping sections. This will ensure the power gets everywhere it's needed around the layout. We we'll need some wires, enough space and a plan would be nice. So let's have a look at such a plan. We will use a scenario where three trains are running. If we apply the mathematical formula mentioned earlier, this means we will need a total of four blocks. I have designed a beautiful oval layout using my track planning software package to illustrate this, as you can now see on the screen. We will start by inserting the control tracks that will be used by passing trains to trigger signaling changes. These tracks are marked in dark red on the plan. Next, we will need to place our signals. We will need one signal per block. The direction of travel for the layout is anticlockwise, as represented by the blue arrows now on the screen. In the direction of travel, each signal needs to be located directly before a contact track, as can be seen on the plan now. We can then look at connecting the signals to the contact tracks. First, we'll take care of the default state. We have seen previously that all signals are immediately set back to red after the passage of a train. To set this up for each signal, the wire controlling the red aspect will be connected to the contact track directly ahead of it. Our block system is now set up so that all blocks are automatically closed when a train leaves. We can now look into the connection of the wires controlling the green aspect of each signal. This will determine in what order trains move within the block system. There are a few ways to do this. In this video, we will look at two options. The first one is what I called the push method. In this scenario, using this method, trains always trigger a change to green in the block ahead. This will determine how we do the wiring for the block system. So let's go back to our plan. It is in the shape we left it just earlier with all red aspects uh, wires connected to the switching track ahead of the uh, relevant signal. We are going to start by looking at the top right hand corner of the screen where I am going to use a little blue locomotive as a marker. So this contact track would have to trigger the green aspect of the signal in the following block. Therefore, we need to connect the wire controlling the green aspect of the signal to uh, the next signal. Uh, for the next contact track, the same logic is applied. We need to trigger the signal in the block ahead, so the green wire will go from that switching track to the next signal. For the next uh, contact track, the same uh, process repeats, and for the next contact track, the process is also the same. And we have completed the setup of our block system. It's now ready for operation. Now let's have a look at how the blocks would interact with each other. So I have set up three trains and we are going to start at the bottom right hand corner of the screen uh, where you can see a blue locomotive. Let's give it a green signal. The locomotive will start moving, hit a switching track and set the signal behind it to red. It will then set the signal in the next block to green. Then it will enter the block, travel along the distance of the block until it reaches the next signal. It's set to green, so it will pass it and reach the next switching track. At this point, the signal behind the blue locomotive will be set back to red and the signal in 
The block in front will be set to green. The blue locomotive will enter the block. Simultaneously, the black train will pass the green signal it just got, hit the switching track and set the signal behind it to red. It will then simultaneously set the signal in front to green and enter the block ahead. Meanwhile, the blue train will have reached its uh, red signal in front of it. In the purple train will have been set in motion. It sets the signal behind it to red and sets the signal in front of it to green, then enters the block. Meanwhile, the black train is carrying on its journey until it reaches the signal just set to red by the purple train. And the purple train will carry on around the layout and the same process as described before will happen to each block over and over again. So this is all functional. However, there are a few things uh, one needs to be aware of using this method. So first of all, uh, you've noticed the cascading manner in which the signals are triggered. It's always going forward. What applies to the signal also applies to the uh, train problems. So if a train is uh, moving and has an issue, derails, whatever, uh, it will already have triggered a train ahead of it, uh, usually. This means uh, that there is still a collision potential because the traffic carries on flowing if anything happens somewhere. But uh, this system can work well with enough care given to distances between trains to give the operator a bit of time to intervene. This somewhat reduced level of safety has the benefit that the block system still allows a single train to run within it. Uh, you might not want to run three train trains at once all the time and just watch a train going around from time to time. This method would allow you to do this. Let's move our attention to the pool method. As the name implies, the train leaving a block using this method will release the train in the preceding block. So if we go back to the track plan as we left it earlier, uh, if we look at our little blue locomotive again, this time the switching track where the locomotive is located will need to be connected to release the preceding block. So this means the block before the one it just left, as demonstrated by the little arrow on the screen. Uh, if we move to the next switching track, the same logic applies. The uh, green aspect of the signal in the uh, block preceding the one the locomotive just left will have to be connected to the switching track. If we move to the next track, the same logic applies again. And if we move to the next track, the same logic applies again. This makes the wiring slightly more complex as wires are crossing each other, but it's not the end of the world. Let's have a look at the traffic um, in this scenario. We'll start again with the blue locomotive at the bottom right hand corner of the screen and give it a green signal. The locomotive will move, go over the switching track and set that signal back to red. At the same time, it will trigger the signal in the preceding block to green and enter the block ahead of it. The purple locomotive will start moving and pass over the switching track, set the last signal to red and set the preceding signal to green before entering the block ahead of it. The trains will carry on until they uh, meet a red signal. The black train meanwhile will also have started moving, will set the signal behind it back to red and the signal in the preceding block to green and enter the block ahead of it. The blue locomotive will start moving, set the signal behind it to uh, red 
and the signal in the preceding block to green and enter the block ahead of it. It will carry on its journey until the next red signal. The purple locomotive will have started moving as well, set the signal behind itself to red and the signal in the preceding block to green and the same will carry on over and over again until the operator stops the layout. As you might have noticed, this method makes for more energetic traffic. Let's have a look at a few uh, general observations about the pool method. I think it offers the uh, maximum safety because trains have more distance when entering or leaving a block. Uh, cascading problems are less likely because trains moving only trigger events in the back of them. So, if anything was to happen to one of those moving trains, uh, the traffic on the block is more likely to stop as opposed to uh, start a cascade of events ahead of it. Uh, so, the uh, collision potential using this method is further reduced, uh, especially compared with the push method. Uh, there's a small disadvantage though, uh, which is that uh, uh, it requires longer wires and therefore the, wire, the wiring may be uh, messier. And the system doesn't work without a near exact number of trains for which it was designed. So if you intend to run a single train on the same track at some point, uh, this method might not be for you, or you may need to install some uh, additional wiring to be able to enable or disable the blocks or some switching track or activate or deactivate some signals. I won't go into this in this video, but it's something to be aware of. So I hear the uh, question already uh, coming from some of you, which method would I recommend? Well, uh, my only answer about this will be it all depends. On my current layout, for example, I use the push method. Why? because I need the flexibility to be able to run a uh, lower amount of train from time to time and it's a temporary layout. Uh, installing uh, the amount of wiring that would be required to uh, bypass a uh, block system set up with a pool method, for example, uh, would not be worth it. So as with anything in life, I would advise to simply test both methods and pick the one that works best for you. There is no right way to do it, there are only different ways. Whatever way you choose to uh, proceed, there are a few things to consider that will apply across the board to both solutions or methods. First of all, uh, special attention should be paid to the length of the stopping sections in the block. Uh, you don't want locomotives to overshoot signals and all locomotives have different uh, requirements as far as stopping distances are concerned, so they're not equal in this respect. Uh, if you are running out of space, you can use braking areas located directly ahead of the stopping sections. I have done a video which I'll link at the top right hand corner of the screen uh, to explain how to do this. Uh, you should also look at keeping space between trains to a minimum of one train length by default to give your trains a bit of wiggle room whilst accelerating or decelerating and where possible or in strategic areas of the block system install some manual controls in parallel to allow you to intervene in case of issues. And for trouble-free operations I would also pay particular attention to maintenance. Your trains will run more in automated mode on a block system than they probably ever did before or usually do. This will pretty quickly reveal any maintenance weakness hidden somewhere uh, 
within the uh, locomotives or your rolling stock. So I would pay particular attention to motor, axle lubrication, wheel cleanliness, traction, tire state, um, coupling adjustment, and of course the uh, track. Uh, there's always a little imperfection here and there that can lead to a few issues. Once you've uh, looked at all these things and make sure that uh, everything is okay, then uh, I would advise to test, test and test again. And first, instead of uh, setting up several trains with uh, so at several locomotives and the associated rolling stock, I would start with the locomotives only try and get them to run on the block system and you'll soon find out whether the attention you paid to maintenance paid off or whether you've missed something. Uh, once everything runs smoothly you could then start adding some rolling stock and there again I would proceed uh, one train at a time. So take the first locomotive, uh, add a few wagons, try and run everything through the uh, block system. If anything derails on a particular spot or uh, is not working, you still have an opportunity to address it uh, without having to deal with hundreds of other things at the same time. If you take this progressive approach, uh, you'll get much more enjoyment and uh, you'll get very quickly to, or much quicker, to a stage where you can run your trains in your block system smoothly. As mentioned at the beginning of the uh, video, there is plenty of information available online about the topic. If you look uh, a bit, you'll even find versions of the uh, Merklin signal manual in uh, PDF format. They'll mostly be older version, but the uh, principle described within these books has not changed since the 1950s, the time at which they were published. So there's a few references there. There's also a signal a manual available on the uh, Merklin website in its latest version for purchase. There's also hundreds of entries in various blogs which can be as detailed or superficial as you want them to be and of course there's your favorite user forum. Right, uh, we've reached the end of this video. I hope you found the information I provided in it useful. Again, this was just a superficial introduction into the uh, concept, uh, but um, I hope it will help someone uh, just a bit. For now, uh, I'd like to thank you for watching. It's uh, very much appreciated. I'd also like to thank the recent subscribers to the channel. It's uh, very rewarding to see that uh, some enjoy my work so much that they want to be notified when something new gets published on my channel. It's uh, very rewarding. Uh, thank you again for this. But for now, I'll say bye and until next time. Have fun trying things out.